Good morning and welcome to our second event, the film screening and discussion in our series. Okay, good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the second event, the film screening and discussion in our series, Those Who Feed Us, a webinar series exploring migrant farm workers, health disparities, and digital inclusion for better health. My name is Carrie Forbes, and I'm the liaison librarian to the ECU College of Nursing undergraduate programs through ECU's Lopez Health Sciences Library. I'm going to turn it over briefly to Angie Schiavone to explain the interpretation options before we get started. Yes, hello, good morning to everybody. This is Angie Schiavone and I am here today with Felipe and together we've been providing Spanish interpretation services. It is very important for the organizers of this event to make sure that we had a, the opportunity to create a truly bilingual space for folks to be able to participate. So please just bear with me for one moment while I explain in Spanish how interpretation is gonna work. Hola, muy buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, mi nombre es Angelina y estoy aquí junto con Felipe. Estaremos proveyendo servicios de interpretación a español. Me imagino que para ahora ya ustedes están muy familiarizados en cuanto a cómo funciona la interpretación, pero básicamente en sus controles de Zoom que aparecen en la parte de abajo, usualmente de la pantalla o arribita, hay un símbolo redondo de un mundo como el que está en pantalla en este momento que dice interpretación. Presionan ese botoncito y luego se van para español. Si están utilizando un teléfono inteligente o una tableta, esta opción está ubicada Abajo, a mano derecha, van a ver tres puntitos. Presiona esos tres puntitos y luego se va a ir a Language Interpretation. Luego pone Español y luego el botón que dice Don o Finalizar y ya con eso van a poder escuchar en español. Les recordamos que si están llamando a esa llamada o si están utilizando un Chromebook, la interpretación no funciona, así que deben conectar a través de un computador o un teléfono inteligente. Muchas gracias y que tengan una gran conferencia. Thank you. I have gone ahead and made the announcement about interpreting services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Angie. Our event today is a screening of the film Harvest of Dignity and a discussion with student action with farm workers. We hope you'll join us for a panel discussion on digital inclusion and health outcomes on November 3rd at 10.30 a.m. You can sign up for those events on our website at hsl.ecu.edu. We'd also like to thank our partners from the Lopez Health Sciences Library Diversity Committee the North Carolina Farm Worker Health Program, ECU College of Health and Human Service, I'm sorry, ECU College of Health and Human Performance, Student Action with Farm Workers, and the NC State Agromedicine Extension for arranging and hosting these webinars with us. These partners are in their third year of working together with support from the National Library of Medicine to improve the daily lives of migrant and seasonal farm workers by expanding internet connectivity and access to online health information. We want to begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the Tuscarora and Catawba people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live. We honor these tribes by recognizing that our institutions were built on land stolen from those who were here before colonizers arrived. 
We pay respect to eight recognized tribes, Kohari, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Halawasaponi, Lumbee, Meharan, Okanichi Band of Sapani, Sapani, and Wakamasuan all nations and their elders past, present, and emerging. Additionally, this land has borne witness to over 400 years of enslavement, torture, and systematic mistreatment of African people and their descendants. We must acknowledge the history of our spaces and the places that we occupy, both to understand and unlearn the many ways that we have been socialized. A few tech considerations. As you see on the image shown, you have the ability to ask a question in the Q&A box located at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen. Your chat will send to our panelists and our moderator. The language interpretation feature will either be a button next to the, to the chat option or the Q&A as it's located by clicking more. You can exit the webinar anytime by clicking on the red leave button. And now we will watch the film Harvest of Dignity an original documentary created in 2011 by Student Action with Farm Workers, the Farm Worker Advocacy Network, and Minnow Media. Stick around after the screening to hear from our panelists from Student Action with Farm Workers. And Jamie will be preparing our screening. It's been 50 years since the Thanksgiving broadcast by Edward R. Murrow that brought attention to the lives of farm workers. Harvest of shame. It has to do with the men, women, and children who harvest the crops in this country of ours, the best fed nation on earth. These are the forgotten people, the underprotected, the undereducated, the underclothed, the underfed. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Murrow uh, explored uh, issues of housing and pay and education and he revealed problems within the system of agriculture at the time. He hoped to make farm workers more visible. They travel in buses. They ride trucks. They follow the sun. Farm workers are people. Farm workers are just like anyone else. This population is hardworking, trying to earn money for their families. Because you are less fortunate than I am, doesn't mean that I'm supposed to look down on you. Even though we're farm workers, we're all humans. North Carolina was featured prominently in the broadcast of Harvest of Shame, possibly because it was Murrow's home state. Just like in 1960, agriculture is the backbone of the economy here. Farms bring in $59 billion a year, about 22% of the state's income. Farm work is hard work, hand work. More than 85% of fruits and vegetables and nearly all poultry must be picked or processed by hand. North Carolina agriculture relies on 150,000 migrant and seasonal farm workers and another 28,000 poultry workers. Most of the farm workers today are from Mexico and Central America. Some come to North Carolina on special work permits from the Labor Department. Their classification is H-2A. They return to their home countries when the work is through. 
but many more have entered the U.S. without work authorization, just looking for a better life. Greene County is a very rural county, so there is a lot of agriculture. Probably the biggest crop, just from what I see, is probably sweet potatoes. But we also have uh, cucumbers, um, cantaloupes, watermelon, a little bit of uh, blackberry or blueberries. Um, and then, of course, we have the crops that are picked with machines like corn, um, soybeans, and cotton. Steve is a native of North Carolina and has been working with farm workers for 14 years. 14 years ago, uh, the Latino Hispanic population was not that big. Um, they represented maybe 50% of the workforce in the fields, um, where now they represent probably 95 to 98%. I've seen a change from strictly H-2A workers in some of the counties we work in to now they're being strictly migrant, what we call East Coast migrant farm workers, which tend to be more families that come with children and their wives with the H-2A workers are mainly just a single men. I have a very interesting job. Um, we actually go out to where the <laughs> farm workers live, where they work. We serve as health educators. Doña Maria is the matriarch of a large family that came to Greene County as seasonal workers and decided to make it their home. Maria is the mother of 12 and has many grandchildren. She no longer works in the fields. But she is known in the community for her traditional cooking, and she occasionally makes meals for the men in the nearby camp. When Maria's daughter Camila and her husband decided to leave Mexico, it took eight days to cross the border. Yo quería venir a trabajar, sí, y al tercer día yo ya trabajé y siempre he estado trabajando. He trabajado en donde se corre el beque, en la costura, como en tres diferentes talleres de costura, y he trabajado en el campo. Yo para mí el la flor. Del, del, del tabaco. Tabaco entramos a las seis, salimos a las siete o a las ocho. Pues a veces porque no quieren que uno vaya al baño, a veces porque no quieren que uno tome agua. She says she's glad to be in a house with the family. The camps nearby are undesirable. The public response to Harvest of Shame led to new laws regulating housing for migrant farm workers. But in North Carolina, farm worker camps have not changed much in 50 years. The migrants themselves listed the evils of labor camp life. Bad housing, flies, mosquitoes, dirty beds and mattresses, unsanitary toilets, and lack of hot water for bathing. The camps are not located where many people can see them. Most are down dirt roads, off the main highways, many miles from town. We call all sites where people live a camp, but a camp can actually be an old farmhouse. It can be a trailer park or it can be a trailer. There's actually a Barrett-style camp in Greene County as well. We've had cases where septic tanks were overflowing, um, and we've gone out there and children were playing right there next to it, like they were playing in a mud puddle, but it was actually sewage. Growers are required to provide one wash tub for every 30 workers and one toilet for every 10 workers. But that toilet can be an outhouse. The North Carolina Department of Labor enforces our migrant housing law. There are certain standards, there are certain requirements for housing that's provided to migrant workers. We see this housing all the time. We'll file complaints for workers who have holes in their walls or rodents living in the housing or not enough beds or beds on the floor, showers that don't work, toilets that don't work. Unfortunately, we see a lot of sewage problems and the result of those complaints is often fines that then get negotiated down so that the employers really just get a slap on the wrist. A recent inspection by the Housing Assistance Council revealed that 38% of farm worker housing was severely inadequate and unfit for human habitation. I grew up in Brisbane, Australia. I've been here now 31 years in America. 
Larry worked in Florida at Disney World for 10 years, but a layoff left him homeless. He had never heard much about farm work, but thought he would give it a try. They would come to big cities or towns looking for people that's homeless in shelters, and they run this talk game on them about the job and the pay, and then how they con you more, they offer you money to get in their vehicle and say, okay, we don't, you don't owe me nothing. This is how you get trapped in from there. Once you got that money or got in that vehicle, you don't realize what then happened, you, you, you in. Even they had a little fake photograph of how everything looks. Nice housing. Got there was a dump. It was so disgusting. Roaches got in the food while I'm lying there sleeping. Woke up and hit the light and I'm like, whoa, electrical wires everywhere. A shower, I don't think there was no shower. All we had to do wash, the buckets we used was to wash our laundry and our bath and take a bath in. Growers are only required to provide rent-free housing to H-2A workers, but they can charge other workers for housing, food, transportation, and maintenance. We're thinking we're finna get paid what we work for all week. You may see after they get through taking our, wait a minute, what's all this food meals and all this and that, transportation, uh, light water and all this and that. What light water? None of this was a, I owe you $30 for a whole week. What am I supposed to do? I want to buy my own food and all this and that. Well, I'll take you all to town in the morning. Next morning comes up, we never see town. But find out town is 40 miles from where we are. After working all day in the fields, it isn't easy to come back and cook a meal or wash clothes. If you think about a North Carolina summer in those days when it's above 100 degrees and we're all rushing to get into the air conditioner as quickly as possible. The farm workers are out there. According to the National Centers for Disease Control, during a five-year period in North Carolina, seven farm workers died from heat stroke. Farm workers are often scared to take a break because they think that they're gonna be yelled at or there's no shade anywhere nearby. We need a rule that says when it gets to a certain temperature, Farm workers need to be provided with a chance to go spend some time in the shade, cooling down, drinking some water. Heat is not the only health issue for farm workers. I planted pino, fertilizar, sprayar, plantar calabaza, repollo, tabaco. Yo por los químicos pienso que sí me ha hecho un poco de daño, pero mis hermanos y yo los he traído de emergencia al hospital por el tabaco. While it is widely accepted that exposure to pesticides is harmful, there is very little education for farm workers about the risks, especially if they do not speak or read English. No, no explican de ninguna manera. No más ellos mixtean el agua y nos dan una bomba de sprayar y eso es todo. What is incumbent upon the employer is to provide information to the worker. They have to put up a warning sign that says, this is the chemical that we sprayed, this is what time we sprayed it, and this is when you're allowed to go back into the field. And if safety equipment is needed for that chemical, the employer is supposed to provide it. In 1960, DDT was still on the market. At that time, we had no idea what DDT could do to our health. And when it came off the market in 1970, we still didn't know. We took it off the market because of what it was doing to bald eagles and pelicans. And that's important, that's really important. But I was thinking about the, the families and especially the children in all those pictures and sort of the seeds of illness growing in so many of them because of the pesticide exposure they were getting. And how now, you know, DDT is gone, but we have tens of thousands of other pesticides on the market that we didn't have then. And I wonder, you know, I know a lot of farm workers and I know a lot of farm worker children and I wonder about what seeds we're planting in them, you know, what kind of illness is going to develop in them 30 years from now that we'll look back and say, how foolish. Just a few miles from the camp is the home of Guillermina and her family. They have been in North Carolina for eight years. Dura, mi vida, desde muy chica. No tenía sueños. Ahora puedo decir que es lo mejor que me ha pasado en este país. Trabajando en todo, camote, pepino, chile, tabaco, de todo, blueberry. Guillermina's sons have also worked in the fields. They both do well in school. 
I got A's and B's. I worked this summer in, in the tobacco field. I went to the blueberries. Eric is in the eighth grade, and he has great ambitions. Medical surgery doctor. Cuando están en ese tiempo es vacaciones, ellos también van. Ellos se levantan a la misma hora que yo para ir a trabajar. Well, the people that don't know, you know, that the boss don't treat us well. He, he, sometimes they're bad and don't give us breaks. And sometimes they, they don't even give us water to drink. Es triste, es muy triste. Pero esa es la realidad. Esa es la verdad, que no nada más los los padres, sino los niños tienen que trabajar. Y es un, no hay otra alternativa, no hay otra forma de hacer las cosas. ¿Dónde dejamos los hijos? Tenemos que pagar más de lo que a veces ganamos. Guillermina has organized other farm worker women to help them improve their conditions. Their group is called Women Without Borders. They have begun growing their own backyard gardens and raising chickens for eggs. No one was there for me. Guillermina has opened her home to Ingrid, a 15-year-old girl who has no other family. I mean, I love all of them. And for me, they're like my family. Somos muy felices, comemos juntos. Se van a la escuela, regresan, comemos todos juntos, o cenamos prácticamente todos juntos. Sometimes American people, not all of them, but some treat you like trash. It's sometimes dogs are better where they live than us. Because there's like a lot of farm workers out there that live in houses that are not like houses. They don't even have somewhere to, to cook for their food. They don't have beds, they have to sleep on the floor. And when it's cold, they don't have something to warm them up. They have to live in the cold. So it's really hard for us. 20 miles from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the workers pick beans at the prevailing rate of 50 cents a hamper. Lunch is not a picnic, whether brought from the labor camp or purchased at the open air kitchen. We try to help them to feed them in a good way because that way they don't have to get up very early in the morning. If not, they have to get up like 3 o'clock to cook their food because in the camp there's like 10 stove and it's not enough to cook for everybody. The way they feed you, you might as well just pick something up off the ground at the field and eat it. Keep your hand upon the dollar and the dime. Farm workers living in North Carolina earn about 35% less than the national average. Five o'clock in the morning, you're out. You're out in that field around about six o'clock. You may get out of there around about seven or eight o'clock at night. Tobacco and the sweet potatoes. That's where you're really getting slaved out, dogged out. A farm worker needs to harvest and carry 125 buckets of sweet potatoes just to make $50. That's almost two tons. When they say they're going to pay you on the weekends, you get paid Saturday night, maybe about 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Today, even with state and federal laws that affect many aspects of farm worker life, agriculture is still exempt from the regulations that apply to every other aspect of commerce except domestic workers. We have laws that were passed the first half of the 20th century to protect employees in almost every industry. And at that time, we made exceptions for farm work. Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, people are entitled to overtime pay after 40 hours. That doesn't apply in agriculture. And there are only limited protections for minimum wages and workers' compensation. In recent years, workers in the fields have sought better hours and pay by moving into poultry work. But they are finding different challenges. Empezando un trabajador le es difícil de cómo hacer todos los trabajos cuando cuando pasa la línea frente de uno. En el momento que yo llegué me mareaba porque veía que pasaban en ese entonces pasaba 25 pollos en los conos. Yo estaba bajando alas y para mí me fue difícil porque agarraba las 
las alas del pollo y le clavaba el cuchillo de esa manera y no tenía práctica, pues entonces los pollos pasaban de esa manera y pasaba y yo me mareaba porque veía los, los pollos pasaban. Eh, el pollo ya viene limpio y ahí se pone para que dos personas que están a los lados, uno de cada lado, le tiene que cortar la ala, pero el problema es que los conos van demasiado rápidos y el mayordomo está ahí y uno tiene que llenar todos los conos. Entonces, muchas veces yo sentía que me llevaba la mano, eh, que no alcanzaba a hacerlo. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration says that 16 out of 100 poultry workers are injured on the job, and two or three times that many go unreported. El problema que están enfrentando ellos es la línea, porque se lastima la mano sobre la velocidad de la línea. El frío, bueno, lo que he visto son accidentes que pasan ahí. Pues la gente, como tres o cuatro personas, eh, han perdido el dedo desde que yo entré. Sí me gustaría que nos eh, comenzaran a ver como personas humanas, que no solo somos unas máquinas para trabajar. David Lowe talks to Mrs. Doby, mother of nine children. Who works with you out of this family here? Everybody except the baby. Children aren't allowed to work in most industries and certainly not in hazardous industries, but in agriculture, the young children can work. Um, there are still some restrictions. You can work more in the summer than when school is in session, but for the most part, child labor is treated entirely different for farm workers. But the best hope for the future of the migrants lies in the education of their children. But for the children of migrants, education is not easy to come by. Most state child labor laws ignore farm children. And so far as the children of migrants are concerned, almost without exception, they leave school at the age of 16 forever. No platico, you guys are best buddy. <laughs> y entran and you're gonna be sleeping. And you have, ¿quién tiene la primera línea, Sara? Raul spends Saturdays with farm worker youth in the Levante Leadership Institute. These teens are rehearsing a play that is based on oral histories they collected from farm workers. Two of their lead players couldn't attend the rehearsal because they had to work in the fields, harvesting the last of the sweet potatoes. There's 12 students in the program, and we meet twice a month. They read the lines, and I think it's something that's so close to them as well. That's a topic that it's not foreign to them, that it's, they feel it, they live it, they've seen this happen to them, especially being going to school and being told that they don't belong or being treated differently because they work in the field. So you can see sometimes that students performing, you can, some of them get choked up because it's something very personal to them. Basically it's about a student named Julio that came from Mexico and is working in the fields, helping his parents. And most of the students think he's lazy and that he doesn't like school. But the truth behind all that is because he's tired, because he works before school, and when he gets home, he works after school, and he doesn't really get to do his, his homework and stuff. Today, child labor laws allow children as young as 10 to work in the fields for 30 hours a week. Like one of the characters in the play, Julio, says, I have the same dreams and aspirations as everybody else in, this, uh, in the classroom. And I think migrant workers and immigrants, people that harvest our food, our food, we have the same dreams and aspirations as everybody else. It's cool. I think it's a good thing for farm workers like to, to, um, to tell people how the, um, the students work and go to school at the same time. The part I have is like, uh, uh, like I don't know how to say humilde in English, how you say it, humble I think. Like, as a play, like, to defend people that are, that are treated bad by others, like, ah, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. I mean, go back, like, where you came from. My mom is a farm worker. I've, m most of my family are migrant workers. I've seen the struggles they've gone through. Uh, if it wasn't because of my mom, who always pushed me to go to school and said, school's a priority, because she didn't have the chance, I probably w would be working in the fields. It's not fair for children to work in, because children are children. They need to go to school, have a playful life. Raul encourages them to stay in school. I know I might not gonna, I'm not gonna change the world, but I think working with these kids, being able to, for them when they go to college, that's something that I think I've made an impact. And 
just kind of being making my mom proud and making sure that there's changes that eventually might affect her. Elizabeth City, North Carolina. A bean stop. Good for six weeks' work. When I went to work at the health department and I found this book, it was inside a drawer. And I started to look and started to read some of the articles that the person that was there before me uh, had. Jerry had worked with farm workers for 20 years as a public health nurse in Pasquotank County. And then as I started to visit and I started to take my own pictures, I thought, wow, things haven't changed a lot. When Jerry watched Harvest of Shame, she was surprised to see places in her county that she recognized. The conditions were very familiar, too. When I watched the film where the man was doing the pitch to get them to work, uh, I have talked to workers who have told me that very same thing that has not changed. If you go to Elizabeth City, we will give you a place to stay. You will make this amount of money. You get three meals a day. It, it has not changed. Uh, the same story is told when they go to Philadelphia, New York, and they pick these people up at the homeless shelters and, and wherever, and then they get upset when they get here because it's not what they tell them. Jerry says the camp from Harvest of Shame is still standing. And the man that I recognized in the video from the 60s, this was the camp where his crew came. All of this was such an important part of my life. I hadn't really thought about it, uh, making sure that they knew that they had somebody when they got to North Carolina that was going to kind of look out for them. Um, and then the things that I learned from them, you know, sometimes we don't stop to, to realize that we learn from each other. And um, I had some, some of these men um, I learned some things from, too. Not just about uh, grading potatoes, but just, just about life in general. Mm -hmm. I've seen Harvest of Shame, I don't know how many times now. It is, and every time I watch it, I think about and reflect on something different. It really touches on the structural problems within agriculture. I grew up with this mentality too, you know, the idea is that poor people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and if they only worked harder and they play by the system, they're gonna move up. It's just not the reality for most poor people, but specifically for farm workers. They can play by the rules all day long, and they're still gonna be poor. They're still not gonna have protections that other workers have. They are still not gonna have the right to organize and collectively come together to ask for change. And so the system of agriculture, it definitely dates back to the Harvest of Shame documentary, 1960, but it dates further back than that. I mean, our whole agricultural system in this country is based on the system where landowners and agriculture employers and now agribusiness um, controls the, every aspect of a worker's life. W if they get to come here and work in the fields, what time they work, what the conditions are of their work, what their pay is, what time they get to sleep, where they live, whether or not they get to call their family. On the, it's just the, those issues of control that the employers have hasn't changed. We continue to reach out to try to draw people closer to the farm workers and make people visible and to help them from being seen as other. The farm workers that we work with, some of the nicest, hardest working people that I know, probably the most underappreciated, <laughs> underpaid um, workers that I know as well. The reality is that there are farm workers that may have died during the last season of harvesting food. There are farm workers who may have incurred a sickness or a disease because of the regulations that are not being followed or laws that aren't even in place. We as North Carolinians, we as non-farm workers, we as people who can call up our legislators and talk to our colleagues, our friends, the people we go to church with, we should feel ashamed if we're not speaking up for farm workers. And the lawmakers, the people who have the power to change these laws, should be ashamed. A lot of people that don't know where, the, where their food comes from. And for them, it's just like, we don't like belong in here. 
it's their country and they don't care who picks their food. But if, if we weren't here, then who would pick their food? And in spite of the fact that people are doing very hard work and being paid very little for it and treated very badly, it's like there's something wrong with them rather than something wrong with how this whole thing is set up. I mean, the work, nobody remembers the people, or the children who worked. It's sad, but that's the truth. I hope it doesn't take 50 more years. We want to thank the Student Action with Farm Workers for allowing us to screen this film today. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator and panelists. First, we have our moderator, Ms. Eve Portillo, is a senior at ECU majoring in anthropology and psychology with a minor in linguistics. She's a member of the advisory board of the National Library of Medicine Health Disparities Resources Grant at ECU that focuses on health literacy and digital inclusion for farm workers. She is also a governing board member of the NC Farm Worker Health Program. Our panelists today will be Maria Lopez Gonzalez. Maria was born in Mexico City, but immigrated as a baby with her parents to North Carolina. She first was involved with the Student Action with Farm Workers and the Farm Worker Movement as an Into the Fields intern. That summer, she spent the summer lobbying with New Frame following anti-union bills and advocating for tuition equity. She has also previously been on a Solidar Solidaridad Intern Operations Manager and currently directs the ITF program. Monica Contreras is from Thomasville, North Carolina and is currently a senior at UNC Chapel Hill majoring in public policy with a Hispanic studies minor. She became involved in the farm worker movement more in depth by interning at the NC Farm Workers Project in Benson, NC, where she spent the summer conducting health assessments and working at the mobile and dental clinic. I will hand it over to Eve. Oh. Hello. Okay, well, I'll start off by asking Maria and then Monica can go after Maria answer. So the first question is, what is your work and experience with SAF so far? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as uh, Carrie mentioned, I started as an intern in 2017, um, and I now currently direct our Into the Field Summer Internship that Monica participated in, where several of the interns in 2010 helped create this documentary. Um, and so I do a lot of the recruitment, um, planning for the program, creating the workshops, the trainings for students, interviewing, selecting. Um, and then implementing the program in the summer where we place 25 students across North and South Carolina to work with organizations that provide direct services to farm workers and it's in different fields. So we might work with migrant education programs, we might work with legal aid offices, we might work with unions. Um, what else is there? Health clinics and community organizing um, organizations. And I really, with um, two program assistants and another staff member, um, we do a lot of just mentoring, supporting the students throughout the process. 
uh, making sure that they have the resources that they need. And um, whenever I'm not working on the internship, I do a lot of policy work following, um, right now, mostly anti-immigrant bills because in, in our state, that's really what gets introduced at the legislature. Um, and then at the federal level recently have been doing a lot of um, following a federal pathway to, pathways to citizenship or heat stress protections legislation. Um, so doing a lot of a lot of policy work, just reading, researching, and figuring out ways that we can get involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my experience with staff has been great thus far. As Maria mentioned, um, I was uh, an intern for SAF this past summer, and I got placed at the uh, NC Farm Workers Project in Benson. So I was like a health intern, and I loved it because I. Um, got to see and interact with a lot of, um, you know, like medical professionals, but also like the farm workers. We took mobile health clinics to some camps. Uh, we uh, took some of the workers to the clinic in Benson. Um, we held a lot of vaccination clinics. Uh, we conducted health assessments. So it was very, uh, a very interactive process or experience. Um, with the workers, with the project, with, um, you know, everyone that was there and like everyone that was there had a very like strong passion and like desire to be there um, and like to, you know, try to better or try to just aid in whatever way possible um, that uh, to the farm workers and, and help them in their health. Okay, well, thank you. And then, um, Monica, so what is the biggest issue in your mind when it comes to farm worker health? Um, I think the biggest issue is uh, access uh, because many growers like do not allow their workers to kind of take the day off from work to go to the doctor. Um, and they also like, and the workers themselves also don't want to lose work. They feel like um, they might get reprimanded in some way. Um, and like from what I understood while being at the project, um, like many times when the workers do go to like the clinic in Benson or like go to the mobile clinics, um, they're doing that after like going to work that day. So they're working through whatever pain or whatever um, health thing they have going on. And then since those clinics are at night, they don't really leave until 10, 11, 12, and they still have to wake up five, six in the morning to go to work. Um, so allowing like having that access or not having that access to like take the day off or just take half a day or something to go to the doctor during the day to then get more rest at night is um is what i would consider a big problem okay and um maria what what is the biggest issue that comes to your mind when it comes to farm worker health? Um, it's a really hard question, I feel, and I thought about it a lot. And I landed really on racism and capitalism because a lot of these issues, there's so many issues. There are so many issues. Like Monica was saying, access to language interpretation services, access to transportation, access to fair pay, access to citizenship services, that really it's, and historically since, you know, colonization, our agricultural labor force has been just extremely exploited, has always been a group of people that have been othered, has always been to just profit from and exploit at such a ridiculous level that you know it's 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 human beings hurting our people in order to make a profit right we all need to eat food is such a cultural component of all cultures and it's something that we need to survive and like you know in the documentary the girl was saying like 
who's who's going to do it and so you know when we address any of the issues all the issues still exist and it's such a multi-level thing that it's going to take a lot of just tackling a lot of different things from climate change to the just ridiculous cost of healthcare in general um that it's it's a lot to really just pinpoint it to one yeah that's that's so true. There is so many issues everywhere. And um, so if there is one thing you would want us to know or take away from today, what would it be? You can go first, Maria, and then Monica. Yeah, um, I think it would be that kind of like Claremont said in the documentary, that it's going to take all of us to do something. It's going to take all of us to use, you know, our abilities to call on legislators, to sign petitions, to advocate for farm workers, um, because it's not it's not going to change unless there's a demand for change. Um, if we allow for this to continue going and no one places any pressure for the changes to happen, um, you know, it's going to take another 50 years and then another 50 years. Um, and the cycle will just continue if we don't, if we don't all continue listening, continue, you know, in these spaces, learning more about it and really pushing for better protections, better, better conditions. Yeah, to echo that, um, knowing that despite all their like barriers or issues that are present, like they are very capable people and like um, they mentioned in the documentary, like to not look down upon somebody because of uh, the less privileges they have, um, because you know they are they are working for whatever reason personal to them, and like they know what's best for them, and that's why it's also important to um, interact with them, go to camp, see what their um, lifestyle is like, see what what they think they need or what do what they need. Um, that way you can establish like trust and rapport. Um, so they like, they can be open to sharing their experiences. And so then we can also like know like what to do in terms of legislation, like Maria said, and like for them to also um, know that they have support from people outside of their family or friends and support from people here in the, uh, in North Carolina, um, because uh, sometimes it can be really tricky for for some of them to accept help um, because you know they they think they're alone. So like being there and like being present and in, in their lives is um, important for them to feel um, feel the support from from um, others, not themselves. Okay, thank you guys for sharing. And then my. Last question before we open it up to the audience is, what do you think needs to happen in the future for farm workers to access better health care and have better health outcomes? Um, Monica, if you want, you can go first, and then Maria. Yeah, so uh, this might be a little bit more superficial, but. Um, like creating better working environments and like better monitor the growers. Um, so like by creating like a better working environment, um, you know, let them, let the workers know that they can miss a day of work. They can, like they won't be reprimanded by checking on like going to the doctor and getting their health prioritized. Um, additionally, like, uh, also encouraging that to go seek medical attention when something is wrong, because I feel like many of the people who went to the clinics, um, if they had gone before, like whatever the issue was could have been prevented, like uh, encourage more preventative visits. Um, and, you know, go back to all like monitoring the growers and the laws surrounding that, making sure that you know the environment is is safe and um, 
kind of keep them accountable. Yeah, I think that's super important, you know, placing more regulations on growers and the corporations. Um, I would add to it, I think the one right now that we've been really advocating for is a pathway to citizenship for workers. Um, it would allow, it would open up a lot of opportunity, one to access secure jobs, um, you know, what is it? Um, lower the opportunity of, you know, exploitation, if they're able to have that security of being a citizen. Um, I think it's about 50% 50, 50 of all farm workers in the country are undocumented. Um, and I think that's one that's really needed right now. Okay, well, thank you guys for sharing. Um, and now, if the audience has any questions. This is Mary Roby. I don't see any questions yet, but if you have a question, uh, click on the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen and type in your question and I'll be glad to uh, read it to our panelists. Okay, I have a question from Joseph Lee. I know Harvest of Dignity was from 2011. Do you think much has changed since then? I can start. Um, I feel like there has been some change, some positive change. I think especially with a lot of other social issue movements growing, um, it's allow us to really see more support and more people just having a general understanding of a lot of kind of things that come from discrimination in general and how that bleeds into farm worker issues. Um, and so, you know, with the internship program, the interns that we get, we used to start off the summer with a one week uh, orientation where we go through kind of history of agriculture, history of, of farm worker issues, um, kind of um, discrimination and understanding those topics and how they'll ex how they'll see them happening in firsthand throughout the summer and we find more and more students have that understanding we don't have to we we're, we're not starting at a like a starting point we we're starting a little bit more um, at an not lack of better words at an advanced level of you know going digging into the issues and into how we can address them um, both you know by addressing what's happening in the moment with healthcare services and then systematically being able to better um, address some of the deeper issues. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Brett. What do you recommend we do on a day to day basis to support farm workers besides call our representatives, of course. Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, learn more about it. Like we were saying, learn about the history of it, learn about like the current issues, um, get involved in programs like that, like, uh, yeah, with Student Action with Farm Workers or, um, you know, any other local programs. If you are in like rural areas, I'm sure there's something um, that you could be a part of there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll add to that. I know, um, for example, there's National Farm Worker Awareness Week, March 25th through the 31st, I want to say. And there's always several service programs that happen, t-shirt drives, uh, food drives, um, lots of different things like that. Great. Thank you. Rachel says, do you have a good resource for following immigration-related policies and legislation? I'm forgetting the names of some of what we follow. Um, the Farm Worker Advocacy Network, we're a part of, and they, um, through there, we follow a lot of the federal stuff that's ha happening or are, are beginning to follow it a lot more. Um, 
And we have a Facebook now that we are trying to post more on. So I think that's a great source. Um, there are lots of federal organizations that do a lot of the work. Um, but I'm blinking from off the top of my head. We also post a lot of actions ourselves and a lot of updates on what's happening. So we, we can serve as a resource. We have a listserv that goes out where we post updates regularly as well. Um, and you can add, uh, connect to our listserv through our social media or through our website. Great, thank you. Rebecca says, can you speak to the flow of workers going back and forth from here to their place of origin? Um, go ahead, Monica. I don't know if you're going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, uh, the only thing I know about that is through like talking to them, um, and telling and them telling me their experiences. Um, so from what I gathered was they, you know, like completed the season, they, um, did their variety of crops, uh, tobacco, sweet potato, and a few others. And then um, they would go back to like the agency, they would say. And then um, I believe it was taking a bus back, but um, I can't really speak further on to more of, I guess, the logistics of that. All right, thank you. Heidi asks, do you know if there are any current federal or state laws being considered to regulate how growers provide for farm worker housing? Yes, um, I think it is the Department of Labor that enforces those, um, but it's really left up. It's, it's a set of laws and, and they're most enforceable for H-2A workers. So workers that come contracted under the H-2A worker visa um, those that housing provided has to follow those those regulations, but they're kind of at a minimum. So it's I don't know the specific numbers off the top of my head, but it's like one. I think they said in the doc, in the documentary about like one type of like shower washing unit for so many workers, one stove for so many workers, one fridge for so many workers. Um, and there's a lot that still don't get really. It's there's a lot of issues that get compounded because sometimes employers employers um, have to get their housing inspected, but they find ways around it, or sometimes they give different addresses. There's a lot of small things that come that come into play, and I know the um, North Carolina Legal Aid or Legal Aid of North Carolina Farm Worker Unit and the Justice Center does a lot to try to. Um, go out, do legal outreach where they're kind of seeing if workers have any housing issues and if they would like to report a claim um, because it's otherwise hard for the workers to find kind of the legal route to, to do it themselves. Thank you. Jamie has a question. Could you explain a little bit more about all of the different programs that SAF does and some of their work? I know the film mentioned Levante, but what else are you doing? Yeah. So um, we have, it's five programs. So we have our Levante, which is for our high school youth, supporting them, you know, towards um, higher education or post um, high school, whatever their plans may be. Uh, we have Into the Fields, which is our summer internship for college students. Um, I know Monica shared a little bit about her experience. Um, we have Solidaridad, which supports, which is an academic year internship for students in the Triangle area. So usually from NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, NC Central, and some of the community colleges around here. We have our Cosecha program, which is supporting alumni of our other programs who are currently working in the farm worker movement, immigration services, um, because with our other programs, we really try to give preferences to students who come from farm worker backgrounds, who are first generation, who are immigrants themselves. Um, and so a lot of the time we have found throughout the years that, you know, it's their, they're the first ones in their family to get to this point in their careers. And there's a lack of um, resources, a lack of mentorship. And so the program is there to help them um, as, they, as they find their way in their professional lives. Um, and currently we are developing another alumni program uh, that is for kind of um, regional organizers across the country to um, further be able to advocate at a national level for some of this federal stuff going on. Wow, that's very impressive. Thank you. 
Rebecca asks, how do the workers keep in touch with their families and with each other? Doesn't seem like they all have cell phones or service. Yeah, so um, most of them, or at least that I saw had phones and due to like COVID, um, the, they like, at least in the project, they received a lot of like hotspots. So they would take those to the camps. Um, so the workers would use those. Um, and usually at night, like to get service, they would walk out just just a little bit like away from the, from the camps um, and they would talk on the phone there. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they uh, had hotspots in their area, usually around two or two or three, I believe, um, to accommodate, you know, all the people that were um, in that camp. Great, thank you. Uh, Heidi asks, does SAF screen Harvest of Dignity at many of its programs to educate people who may not know about the exploitation of farm workers? Yeah, so part of um, the responsibility of all our staff is to do presentations. So we have a speaker request form on our website and we you know, try to really get invited to lots of college campuses, events, to, and we'll do different things, whether it's screening Harvest of Dignity. Um, we have a mural that our Levante youth created a couple years ago. Um, it's like in my background and our background right now, um, because we use the arts in every program. It's it's an important piece of, of our organization. It's kind of how we started through a documentary class. So we'll use mural, the film screening, we'll do storytelling theater. Um, we do a lot to find different ways to engage um, people to learn about farm worker issues. Thank you. Andrea asks, do you know the numbers of individual growers versus corporate growers? Do the corporate growers have similar conditions on their camps? I don't know if you're gonna say something, Monica. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know the numbers and the differences there. Um, because I was only really um, going to the camps where the, pe the people in the project were taking me <laughs> because you know they're the most familiar um, in the area. So I couldn't tell you what the differences were between, between them. Yeah, I also, I'm a little disconnected from that side of the work, but from my experience going on outreach and from what I've heard from other people, it seems that kind of corporate farms tend to have more issues than small than small farms. And we, we hear um, every now and then workers who are like, oh, our employer is great. Um, he really cares and it's usually a smaller farm. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly says she doesn't have a question, but she wants to say thank you for sharing. This was very eye-opening and not being originally from North Carolina, I knew nothing about farm worker camps or the associated conditions. So thank you so much. Here's another question. How, fre how frequent is it that farm workers or children of farm workers want to own land and run their own farming business? Or is it more the case that people would like to transition from working on the land? I think that, so a majority still right now of workers come from Mexico and I feel like culturally, it's a big piece to it's a big piece of us to own our land back home and so there's a lot of memes that get put out about like you know fighting with your family members over the land and things like that um and so it's it's i think it's a cultural um desire for a lot um but i think here um children of immigrants have more of a desire to kind of move away or find different career opportunities. I think here the desire for land ownership is different than for um, if we were living back home. I don't know if Monica, you would say otherwise. No, yeah, um, I would agree um, because in some of the conversations I had, like that was one of their goals and, um, you know, getting some money because this particular uh, person, like he wasn't, um, he didn't really have that much family back home. Like they had already, you know, 
moved on with their lives, got their own careers and stuff. So he was working for him. Um, and that was one of his goals to get land and like uh, buy a house or, or build a house. Thank you. Uh, Brett had a follow up. How do you recommend we find orgs to support uh, the rural areas that we live in? It might depend on your state. Um, North Carolina, I think one way to do it is to go through the organizations that are part of, for example, the Farm Worker Advocacy Network. Um, some of the educational programs are supporting, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a state agency, the Migrant Education uh, Program, but they'll have districts or in some cases, or in some counties, the county itself has its own program for the migrant education. Um, but there are organizations across Eastern rural North Carolina. So like, I think it's Johnson County, it's a school farm worker ministry. There's the farm workers project in Benson, the farm workers project in Whiteville. Um, towards Western North Carolina and Morganton, there is the Good Samaritan Clinic, uh, Western NC Worker Center, um, Eastern North Carolina is NC Field, um, Amex Gun I know is doing a lot. So there's a lot of different organizations. And I think um, one way could be going through FAN or um, maybe a, a Google search could probably have some of them come up. Um, but we post, we share a lot from them as well, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone mentioned that Farm Worker Justice and NC Justice Center might have more information about immigration law and advocacy as well. Kimberly asks, let's see, in response to the question about resources, I was informed that we can register for updates on legislative topics through the North Carolina General, General Assembly website. So wasn't a question, but yes, yeah, some more information. Can you speak to how COVID-19 has impacted access to care for farm workers? Have you noticed any major changes? I imagine a lot of services were limited due to the pandemic, but have farm workers in your area been able to use telehealth services? Yeah, so um, since I did the internship this past summer, um, you know, right in the middle of COVID, telehealth was heavily implemented. Um, so like Mondays was mobile clinic nights, um, Tuesday, or Mondays and Tuesdays were mobile clinic nights, and then Wednesdays um, were days for telehealth. And so um, one of my coworkers would have a list of people that she had gone out to kind of see like who needed a follow-up or who needed to speak to a professional. Um, and she would call them, you know, conduct health assessment, do um, like, uh, what, what do you need? Um, but they were telling me that in the beginning of the pandemic, um, they would still go out to do like health assessments and stuff, but they would like, you know, wear like proper PPE um, and, you know, really try to uh, maintain a distance, luckily at that time, um, or at least a little bit afterwards, like COVID cases did go down. However, um, I think right now there has been like an increase in COVID cases, like in, in whole camps. So I'm not sure how they are tackling that, but I'm pretty sure they're still um, conducting like health assessments, of course, wearing PPE and distancing, um, but they might have put a little bit more emphasis on um, telehealth and conducting, you know, uh, video calls or, uh, or phone calls. And I'll just add, um, at the beginning of COVID, so access to camps has always been really difficult. And I know in 98, I want to say there was a sheriff in Blaine County that was able to write a letter. Um, and I think in one other county, at some point, writing a letter um, saying, that farm workers have tenants rights. And so as outreach workers, if they get invited to go provide their services, they are able to go and visit workers because um, they're able to invite whoever they like. Um, but it's it's really difficult for, um, to access them throughout either way because one, intimidation from employers. So I've gone on outreach where the employers come out and they're like, you can't be here, this is private property, you have to leave, even though we've already received the invitation from the workers, and so it's been a huge kind of push 
for many, many years to get an official letter for the whole state, not just one from the 90s from a sheriff in Blaine County. Um, and they were able to do it. It was it was a little halfway through the, the uh, 2020, um, but they were able to get the attorney general, Dosh Sign, to write a letter saying, defending that workers have tenants rights. So it's, it's increased access a little bit, but it still continues to be an issue. Do you know if the, anyone was able to provide uh, like a mobile vaccine clinic or anything like that? Yeah, so kind of um, echoing that about access to camps. Um, I didn't really see this side of it, but you know, they had to ask permission from the growers and from the workers as well. Like if they wanted to have a vaccine clinic there. Um, and if we did have that access access from the grower and then permission from the workers, because you know, it's ultimately their choice if they want to get the vaccine, um, we would take, um, um, you know, <laughs> the vaccines and then like take little like tents, little tables uh, to set up for them to kind of line up, uh, get the information and then uh, get the vaccine. We had a doctor there, a few uh, medical students. Um, since the NC Farm Workers Project was really close to Campbell University and then UNC as well, many med students, PA students, um, grad students even, would come out and help um, during mobile clinics and the vaccination clinic. So it was very much, um, we had to go to the camps um, because again, they get out really late um, and you know they still wanted to get the vaccine, especially after you know receiving um, the health education of, of the vaccines. Thank you. Could you give examples of how language barriers are managed? Do you want to share, Monica? Um, and like in terms of like them speaking Spanish, most of them do speak Spanish. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure um, of where where they were going with this, but maybe uh, in regard to. Um, health professionals interacting with them. Uh, go ahead. I'll say most interns, um, most interns that we get, so one of the trainings that we do during orientation week um, or early on is an interpretation uh, training and how to properly interpret, um, how to, the ethics around it, um, because our students come with this advocate mindset, but in interpreting in like the clinical setting, it can be a little bit different. Um, and so a lot of the times these clinics especially will have the students go with workers to their uh, appointments and they'll interpret there um, because a lot of the times the clinics that they're getting, getting redirected will not have their own interpretation services. Um, all of our interns are bilingual, uh, Spanish English bilingual as that's the prominent language that they speak. And I think a lot of the organizations really prioritize having staff having staff that are Spanish English bilingual. I'll add to that, that if it is in like a health setting, as I mentioned, there are a lot of med students there um, who also um, speak, some speak Spanish. So they um, also go in with the patient and a doctor to translate um, if it's not like a member from the project or um, like a staff intern. Someone asked how many participants we have, and we have 41 right at this moment, but I think we got up in the 50s earlier. I'm not sure, Jamie, you might want to correct me about that. But that is the last question I see in the Q&A. Does anyone else have any questions that you'd like to add at this point? Had a lot of Thanks to you, Maria and Monica, for participating in this and agreeing to share your knowledge and experience with us. It's really been so invaluable, so important. Thank you all so much. Yeah, many thanks to you all for putting this event together and for everyone who attended. Um, I would love to encourage everyone to really follow us on social media or check out our website for more information. We have a whole page dedicated to fact sheets, documentary students have produced throughout the years, um, all sorts of materials.
Thank you so much. Jamie, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A at this time. Great, thank you so much. I just wanted to say again, a huge thank you to our panelists, um, Carrie Forbes for doing our introduction, Eve for moderating the panel discussion and everyone involved with the series. Um, we have one more event next Wednesday, 10.30 a.m. It'll be another panel discussion focusing more on digital equity and inclusion with farm workers um, and in general. So we hope we'll see you next week and thank you all so much. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye now, everyone.